from just outside the Empire City at the crossroads to the northeast. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you are and whenever you are, this is your premier podcast for all things unknown, not media, and I'm your host, JP. Welcome to the third episode of Not Media, and on this episode, we are going to be going over um, the topic of Roswell and all things that are have known to have cr- occurred there, or at least the most important things. I think uh, if anybody looks deeply into this matter of the Roswell incident, or the supposed Roswell crash of an unidentified object um, in July of 1947. Uh, And they track the timeline of the whistleblowers that have come forward and the leaks that have come out about this event, that they will find out that Roswell seems to be the gift that keeps on giving. And that is in the sense of Roswell is a topic where there's just been so many witnesses that have come forward Uh, up to this point. I believe there's over 600 witnesses that have come forward and 150 firsthand witnesses um, speaking about the events that occurred, most of which, uh, which occurred within that week, approximately. It was give or take about a week of a, in the area of July 3rd, 1947. Let's get into it. I hope everybody tuned in for our last episode, episode two. I got to interview Stephen Bassett, who is a huge uh, figure in the world of UFO disclosure. And now I guess you would call it UAP disclosure. And, you know, he's been working on that effort since the mid 1990s. And finally, a lot of his work has come to fruition, or it's starting to come to fruition right around now in 2023, especially, uh, not get, I don't want to get too far into it, especially with the proposal of the, I guess there's a act that they're trying to put forward into uh, Congress. It's called the Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena Disclosure Act of 2023. And that's being brought forward by Senator Chuck Schumer, and uh, who's a Democrat, and Republican Senator Mike Rounds. And they're leading an effort to um, compel the government and Department of Defense to release records on UFOs, UAPs. So stay tuned. That will be uh, some definitely uh, interesting news, especially with a now... um, Proposal for a July 2023 hearing, a second hearing on the UAP phenomenon in Congress. So I'm looking forward to it. Let's get into what we have planned for today. Uh, We're going to start off with uh, the beginning of Roswell. I actually did a, uh, or one of my undergraduate classes. Uh, When I was getting my criminal justice degree, I did an in-depth paper on the supposed Roswell uh, crash, and um, there's definitely a crash there, you know, and I'm I'm definitely a proponent that uh, whatever crashed there wasn't something that uh, came from this planet, so if you want to kind of take a, a journey with me back through that process about how I came to this conclusion, I'm going to try to cover as much as I can, and I don't want to make it too boring for anybody because if you're not really, really into Roswell, I think everybody wants to get straight to the meat and potatoes, and it's like, yeah, it's easy to make these huge claims of um, alien spaceships crashing, but for a lot of people that aren't believers... That's just too much of a leap for them. So they don't want to sit there and take the walk back through the line of thinking of how we got to this conclusion. They just want to say, oh, no, this is impossible. You know, uh, uh, 
how would uh, beings that are not from here, possibly another world, possibly another dimension, travel um, with such great technology, you know, hundreds of thousands of light years or thousands of light years, and then, you know, crash into a, a, a ranch out in the desert, you know, that's impossible, you know, like there's a lot of conjecture about what is possible and what's not possible. And, you know, as far as the reasons for this, I don't have an answer, but I do have an answer for that. What we do have are many, many witnesses who were very, very, very credible people that have come forward over the years to speak about this matter. So that's what we do have. And we've had some whistleblowers, some very high level whistleblowers over the course of time. And unfortunately, because of the political climate here in the United States, these whistleblowers, you know, now, which may have been protected, like the likes of, say, like a David Grush, 2023, you know, the news is actually giving him a fair shot at having a voice. Um, that wasn't granted with Jesse Marcel Sr. in 1978. So uh, even though he was very much a whistleblower who very much was right at the center of um, one of these crash recoveries, you know, David Grush was not. He just had, you know, secondary tertiary information being an insider. He had the clearance and he had to speak to people who did have access to these programs, but he himself did not. So it's great that he's a whistleblower, but you know, it's also sad that looking back in time that we've had other whistleblowers that did have direct access to crash retrievals that have come forward that have been ignored. So I don't know. I can't speculate on whether that's going to be addressed or not in this upcoming uh, act, this UFO, this UAP Disclosure Act. I can't address if that's going, I can't um, make a comment if that's going to be addressed in the um, July hearing on UAP phenomenon, but um, all I can say is that I found out a lot of information. I did well, uh, very well on my paper, and I'm kind of rehashing a lot of the stuff that I learned from the paper, a lot of the stuff I've done research on over the years, and I also recently, just to brush up on what was going on with Roswell, um, I read a phenomenal book and just want to recommend that for those of you who um, have, are not familiar with, with, with Roswell and would like to get up to speed on what's going on. Some of the stuff in the book uh, I'm not going to mention here because there's just too much. And some of the stuff that I know through my research are not mentioned in the book. So uh, that's kind of why I'm doing this podcast because, uh, you know, this whole line of research, you know, up until even now, especially when I got involved with it, I realized something. And this is what excited me about this type of research. You are taking the ride out on the Oregon Trail, so to speak, intellectually here. You're going off into an area that's unexplored. You're going off into an area where who we're calling the brightest minds and I'm not knocking them for not being bright minds because there are, you know, many, many highly intelligent people out there teaching at uh, colleges and schools, you know, these, these are the best and the brightest of what we have to offer. But it, it comes down to um, a social stigma behind this topic that has not allowed our best and brightest minds to be actively researching this topic, you know, and we do have some very, we have some very brave researchers, you know, the likes of Richard Dolan, who have become some world authorities on this matter because, you know, someone like Richard Dolan, you know, and Stanton Friedman and, you know, many other researchers just were chasing after the truth and not really worried about what the social stigma was. So, you know, so we didn't have that going into this research, even when I got involved in the mid 2000, 2007 ish era of uh, UFO research when I first got involved with this whole matter. Um, there was a lot of information, a whole lot, and that's one of the things I found the hardest about this research. When I was trying to get to the core root of what happened at Roswell, I was, I was overwhelmed.
with the amount of information that I was, was coming at me. And there was so much an effort to discredit the witnesses. Every time you read something positive, you'd read something negative. Every time you read something negative, you'd read something positive and back and forth and back and forth. And it was really up to you to be able to have to sift through that pile of hay and look for that needle. And you really had to have a sharp mind for it. So, and that, I mean, it's gotten better, but you know, it's like, is there a one-stop shop where you could get the d definitive answer of what happened at Roswell? I'd say if there was a book, this book by um, Thomas Carey and Donald Schmidt, I think we're up to uh, the witness to Roswell. It's unmasking the 75-year cover-up. I think they did a 75th anniversary witness to Roswell, and they've um, they've compiled over 600 witnesses and 150 first-hand witnesses over the course of their research. So um, I guess if there w would be a one-stop shop, you would want to check that book out to kind of just get you up to speed with what's going on at Roswell. But like I said, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take um, some other uh, research that I've done, and I'm going to try to compile it all together, you know, concisely as I can without getting confusing because it's, like I said, you're kind of walking off into the Wild West here. And I don't mean the Wild West like off into space, no, no pun intended, like there's no merit to this, like we're just all making wild conjectures. There's a lot of information available and to be able to weave that, all that information, take that, throw it down and weave it all into a concise story, all working together, all tying together in the correct way is extremely difficult because there's just so many people that have come forward you know, and yeah, each person has to be vetted and each story has to be backed up against another story. And, um, you know, there was a, you know, incident. I remember when a book was written by Bill Burns, who was, uh, one of the head guys for that show on the history channel, UFO hunters, um, and a retired, uh, military, um, I think, let me see what his rank was. I think he was Lieutenant Corso, he wrote a book, uh, Bill Burns wrote a book with a retired military whistleblower and Lieutenant Colonel Philip Corso, and all about how he was responsible for seeding the industry with Roswell technology. Stanton Friedman, who's one of the main proponents of Roswell, thought Corso was a fraud. And because some of Friedman's dates didn't line up with some of Corso's dates, Friedman put his foot down and said, hey, I've done my homework. You know, I'm one of the leading authorities in the world on this topic, and I know my dates, and your dates don't match my dates, which leads me to believe you're not telling the truth. So other people don't aren't on that same page. They believe Corso was was the real deal. And he has a lot of the pedigree to back it up. But Friedman, I, I strictly remember, I was able to interview him for my paper, fortunately, before he passed away via email. And Friedman, and I've met him before, and uh, Stanton Friedman said that uh, he believed Corso was a fraud. So uh, let's start off here. What we have is a first... Um, date for a crash on uh, what happened at Roswell, and it's going to be July 3rd, 1947. We're going to take you back in time, and we're going to take you to Corona uh, in New Mexico, where local ranchers heard a loud explosion. The foreman of the H.S. Foster Ranch was a man named Mac Brazel. Him and a... Um, I was trying to get the age of the other person he was with. I believe it was a lot younger. Uh, D. Proctor. I think from one account I was reading, D. Proctor was much younger than Brazel at the time, maybe still a child. Um, they went out there to the ranch, and they found I-beams that were black. You couldn't break them. You couldn't bend them. They had like some strange purple hieroglyphics on them, um, some shiny metal, uh, thin filaments that transmitted light, you know, kind of this sort of thing that was very strange, had never been seen before. And I said the um, hieroglyphics that I'd never seen before on these black balsa wood weighted 
but much harder like steel uh, I beams were uh, a purple hue a very strange material um, Brazel uh, went back to Roswell um, he contacted the sheriff who then contacted the 509th bombing group uh, Colonel Blanchard which was headed by Colonel Blanchard um, just a quick history um, so the 509th was uh, the bombing group responsible for dropping the two bombs during World War II on Japan. And uh, I'm trying to get the, they called them the, uh, I believe the nickname for those planes was the Silver Plates. They were modified B-29s that delivered the atomic bombs. Uh, these were the only silver plates on the planet because no other country had the atomic bomb at the time. So this was, by all intents and purposes, this was the most top secret um, bombing group or the, the most elite bombing group in the entire world at the time. Um, Army intelligence officer Captain Marcel from the Roswell base um, came out there with a counterintelligence officer Sheridan Cavett. Um, Cabot later denied he was being there, didn't really want to talk about it. He was a real Boy Scout. He was a real um, strict military man. So he never talked about what happened out there and just kind of settled on that. It was a uh, weather balloon. He retired as a lieutenant colonel. Um, really, he's been one of the only witnesses that was there that has been rejected as a witness because he refused to talk and another person came out there and it was master sergeant lewis rickett they went out there to the ranch within a few days by the evening of july 6th they took horses out there and saw the debris field they concluded that because there was no object on the ground that it must have exploded in midair and i think there was no uh, impact point on the ground um, moving forward, uh, troops spent two days cleaning up the, de the debris, and they also canvassed the area, too, for civilians, and uh, they went as far as to pry up um, a livestock. Uh, they had, like, a livestock sheds. They would pry up boards and livestock sheds and use industrial vacuums to clean up the remnants out there. They were... Um, really concerned on cleaning up whatever this debris was. Many people were threatened. We're going to get a little bit more into that as we move forward. Um, and even afterwards, Mac Brazel was taken into custody um, after witnessing what he saw out there. Uh, a lot of people didn't see him for about a week. And then when he got out of custody from the uh, Army Air Force, I just want to clarify, uh, Army Air Force, the Roswell Army Air Force was a precursor to the Air Force. This is back when the Army and the Air Force were one unit. So I don't exactly, I think soon after this event, the two divisions were made separate. But as of this time in Roswell, it was the Army and the Air Force. So the Roswell Army Air Force was responsible for um, handling this matter. Um, when Mac Brazel got out of custody, he all of a sudden had a new pickup truck and he quit his job as being a rancher and he was able to leave his rancher's business, um, in Alamogordo and, uh, start, start, start a new ranching business actually for his own. He didn't have the money to do this being a, a local rancher from what a lot of people said. So a lot of people certainly are speculating that the Air, uh, Army Air Force paid Brazel a large sum of money. And um, as we'll see later on, Brazel was not one of the major whistleblowers, even though there was a lot of secondary information that Brazel knew a whole lot more than he ever went on the record and spoke about. But it seemed like he had the fear of God put into him through a series of threats and bribes from the Army Air Force that he did not decide to speak. Um, even his son, Bill, said his dad was never the same after going out to that ranch. So he saw something out there. And as we're going to see, uh, Brazel saw a little bit more than uh, what I just mentioned up top, you know, some shiny eye beams and some thin filaments, you know, and then maybe that was strange material, but Brazel saw a whole lot more, you know, I think uh, from what 
all the other witnesses are saying. It looks like Brazel found a secondary crash site where he actually saw some bodies that were associated with a, maybe like an escape pod from this original crash at a second site. We're going to get into that second site in a little bit, but there was a secondary site associated with the first crash on July 3rd, 1947. And I believe it was about two miles east of Corona where that first site was. Looked to be some like some sort of an escape pod was ejected from whatever this original object was. And uh, they have found that remnants of that pod and they also found bodies associated with that uh, pod. Um, even two years later, after the event, Roswell tossed Brazel's home looking for unknown m materials. So that, that's how close of an eye the Army Air Force kept on Brazel. Frank Joyce, who was KGFL, uh, Roswell Radio, broke the story. Um, he later on became a whistleblower, in a sense, even though he wasn't a military member. But or at least a witness, let's just put it like that. And uh, he said shortly before Brazel was held for that week, he stated there was a horrible stench from another site where there were dead creatures or little people that were not monkeys and not human. So this is what Brazel told Joyce before the Roswell Army Airfield uh, sequestered him. And... Uh, to be like threatened and bribed him but he told Joyce that he found this secondary site and there were dead there were dead little people that were not monkeys and not human and um, the FCC threatened KGFL and Joyce was gathered up and sent to a Texas hospital for a year or two after for reasons that were not clear to him it was thought everybody thought maybe he was going to have more access to Brazel so they decided to separate those two and like I said, they went to really far lengths to separate, intimidate, bribe, do what they have to do to keep this situation quiet. A um, little quick summary of a Roswell Army Air Force 509th, um, nation's most elite, as I stated. In 1947, um, Marcel was a bombardier, a waste gunner, had logged 468 hours of flying combat in B-24s, and was awarded five air medals for shooting down enemy aircraft in World War II. Highest honor. I told you what silver plates mean already. These are B-29s modified for delivering atomic bomb. Uh, very, very high level of security. Only atomic capable planes on the planet at the time. And later, told by Marcel in 1978 that the object had skipped along three fourths of a mile. So there was a debris field two to 300 feet long. There was metal as thin as cigarette foil there, but it couldn't be dented with a 16 pound sledgehammer, crumpled, cut, or burned. The eye beams, like I stated, were light like balsa, unbreakable like steel, unable to cut, burn. Lavender hier hieroglyphics were not decipherable by any means known at the time. Marcel's conclusion in 1978, he said this, definitely not a weather balloon, Definitely not a tracking device, nor was it any sort of missile or plane. It was something I had never seen before or since. It certainly wasn't anything built by us. It was not made on this earth. And that was Roswell's conclusion. Uh, I'm sorry, that was Marcel's conclusion. And he was the senior intelligence officer out there at Roswell Army Airfield, 1978. Um, crash 1, again, had a second site revealed in... We first learned about this second site in 1984 by a series of documents that Lee Ford called the MJ-12 documents. And again, that was two miles east of Corona Debris Field. And there was a compartment uh, crew recovered by a set of and, uh, four alien bodies. Uh, Brazil found the alien bodies here. Stanton Freeman, UFO expert and longtime researcher of Roswell. Um, was one of the main reasons why this story ever even broke nationally because of the thousands and countless thousands of hours that Stanton Freeman invested in this story to bring the truth about this forward. So, unfortunately, uh, we do not have Stanton Freeman anymore. He passed away, I believe, uh, sometime in the past five years, I think in the, in the area of somewhere around 2000, 16, 2017, I forget exactly when, but we recently, within the past, certainly within the past five to ten years, we lost Stanton Friedman, unfortunately. So, 
and he's missed greatly because of it, all of his contributions in the world of ufology. Um, this is actually, this information is actually from an interview I was actually able to get with Stan Freeman from my paper. Um, Freeman believed, and now this is not something I've heard by Schmidt or Carey, but Freeman believed possible mid-air explosion of this object, the ejection of a skate pod, possibly there might have been two UFOs that collided in mid-air because we have an escape pod, we have the debris field, and then there's a third crash site with a, another ship that was damaged but somewhat intact. So, you know, there is a possibility, according to Friedman, that there was two UFOs or, or it could have been one UFO that, for whatever reason, had some sort of mid-air explosion due to unknown reasons. It rained some debris down or skipped across this field, took back off, and then a a skate pod ejected out from it and then it came to a final resting place on the plains of St. Augustine, New Mexico, I believe, which was approximately 150 miles away from the, I think it was northwest of the uh, Corona um, crash site. So there was definitely a third crash site and that is confirmed by all researchers. So we have the debris field. We have the escape pod next to the debris field, and then we have a third crash site. And these are the three crash sites associated with the Roswell incident. Um, and this third crash site occurred, or third debris field, whatever you want to call it, occurred um, on the plains of St. Augustine, New Mexico. And the reason why we know some of this, Grady Barnett was from the U.S. Uh, Soil Conservation Service, uh, saw a broken silver object, aliens nearby, he was a model citizen, died in um, 1969. And I think this story came forward through associates of his, uh, Vern Maltis and Officer W. Lead, because, you know, he passed away before he actually was able to become a... A witness when you know after 78 when Marcel broke the story that's when we had other people coming forward but before that we didn't have anybody coming forward so maybe just stories that he was telling family members and things that might have not been public knowledge at the time because he passed away in 1969 um, Gerald Anderson came forward after unsolved mysteries covered this in 1990 he was a first-hand witness he was six years old during 1947 and he was looking for a rock called moss a gate with his dad, brother and uncle. They were out there in the New Mexican desert side and they found uh, an alien ship with two dead and one living alien. A second group of people came along to that crash site as they were out there. They thought it was a doctor at first, but he was not a doctor, Buskirk. Uh, it was archaeologists. I think he was a teacher, and he had five students. They were all shocked. Um, this man attempted to speak to the living alien in several different languages. And there was no communication. Um, military showed up on the scene that ordered them to go. Um, and then... They, they said they had a patriotic duty to keep silent. That's what the military told them. Um, the years later, um, a woman named uh, Marianne Gardner came forward. Uh, she was a cancer board member. Uh, one of the female archaeologists that were there out there in that morning just mentioned was dying of cancer, I believe, in the late 1980s. And she confessed that she was at the site. And one of those people and, and witnessed that second crash or third debris field. Ed Sane, Private First Class of the 390th Air Squadron. He was attached to the 509th Bombing Group, um, was out there at the second or the third debris field uh, out there in St. Augustine. And he was ordered to um, shoot anybody on site if they entered that crash site. So he was ordered to use lethal force at that crash site. He said, quote, little green men were kept Intense on site. Frederick Benthal, along with Kurt, uh, Corporal Kirkpatrick, were two men that came forward and they were photographic specialists. They took pictures of the alien bodies. They both went on the record and stated they were there. Earl Fulford ordered with 15 other soldiers to go back out there and pick up all debris from the crash site and store them back at the Roswell Army Airfield at Hangar P3. 1994. 
when um, the Air Force stated that, okay, so 1994, the Air Force tried to conflate why people stated they were seeing alien bodies. Um, there was a secret operation called Operation High Dive, which tested um, crash test dummies by throwing them out of planes. That did not start at least for another two years, and I believe in that area, they did not start until 1954. So there was quite a time discrepancy between the time that people stated they were seeing these alien bodies and Operation High Dive. And you know, let's just be honest. I think you're insulting the intelligence of people to state that. If you've ever seen a picture of a crash test dummy, that's pretty easy to pick out. Um, if you had to see a crash test dummy and you saw a small three and a half foot tall grayish being that weighed approximately 40 pounds that had large black eyes and a big head. I don't, I have a hard time believing that there's very many people that would get those two mixed up. Those crash test dummies are pretty big. They're a different color. They're a different size. They're clearly mannequins. Um, but anyhow, the Air Force said that people were suffering from something called time compression where they conflate uh, events due to aging. So once you get older, you can't distinguish anymore like, oh, this happened to me in 1985. No, it really happened to you in 1995. You know, people just get confused. So I don't know. I think unless you're suffering from dementia, that's a pretty big time discrepancy. I know I have never accidentally gotten two things mixed up in my life looking back that have had a 10-year time discrepancy. But I'm only speaking personally. I think anybody else could come to that conclusion on their own if they've experienced anything like this time compression. Uh, it just sounds to be something that is muddying the waters by the efforts of the Air Force so people cannot get at the truth. The craft was taken via flatbed truck and associated members of the fire department in Roswell to Hangar P-3. That Hangar P-3 now eventually was changed to Hangar 84. No clarity what year the name was changed. Anderson was actually given a polygraph in 1991, and he was examined by professional uh, polygraph association Robert Riggs, a former police officer with 10 years of experience as a polygraph examiner. He was, he was given a two-hour test, and there was no evidence of any deception or pathology. Anderson has an excellent memory. Also, a manager clinic trained psychiatric social worker John Carpenter worked with Anderson for a year and was greatly astonished by Anderson and believed he was telling the truth. So this guy Anderson uh, apparently checks out through all the means possible to check him out available in 1991. Supporting witnesses for alien bodies, Major Corso, he worked in Intel and in Fort Riley, I think that was in Kansas on July 6th, and um, his friend Brownie led him, led him to a building, I have here a veterinary building. So I don't know where exactly that was stored on the base, but um, he said his friend Brownie led him into a building when he was stationed in Fort Riley and, uh, and on July 6, 1947, and he viewed an alien in blue liquid and noted in an a, in, a inhabitant from uh, Roswell Crash. I think this is the time discrepancy that uh, Friedman was uh, concerned about because Friedman doesn't have anywhere in his records that the bodies were taken there on the date of July 6th. So I think that's where Friedman had a problem with uh, Corso because, you know, when you come forward stating that you witnessed something like that, um, you want to make sure that your dates line up with what you know, you want to make sure they can verify this, the claim of your story. So, uh, moving forward, um, also a man named Glenn Dennis, who worked as an bomber at the Ballard Funeral Home, came in and stated that Roswell Army Airfield called him about child-sized caskets and how to preserve bodies in the desert. Dry ice was ordered from Cardi's Deli. Unfortunate, Dennis states, uh, unfortunately, according to Karen Schmidt, um, they're saying that he impeached himself because he said that later on he met a nurse at a diner. Uh, so he was he went to the hospital. He was speaking to a nurse. A sergeant and captain made a threat 
telling Dennis that he would need an embalmer if he didn't get out of that hospital. Uh, and he met that nurse later on, and she drew a picture of an alien on a napkin, and he kept that. And um, researchers tried to track this lady down. Her name was Mary Lowe, the closest person they could assume that she was. And Mary Lowe's friend said she was there at the time. And, but Mary Lowe denied who she was. He didn't even give the correct name. So they're saying they can't take Dennis as a witness because he's lying about names. And he said he lied about the name to protect her. But he never came forward with any further information about why he did that or when he did that. So he was not willing to talk much about that. And um, so they're saying he impeached himself so they cannot take him serious, even though there's a lot of secondary speculation that Dennis very well have been telling the truth about many aspects of what happened out there, such as that Robert Airfield calling him and asking him for child-sized caskets, uh, a man named Adam Dutch who worked as a boy at a local grocery store, overheard employees from Ballard's Funeral Home asking about child-sized caskets, one of a handful of witnesses including uh, Gardner Mason uh, who worked at a family-owned mortuary service. He delivered ca uh, caskets made of cardboard to the hospital there, or you know, he, or at least to the Army airfield. He actually made a delivery. So there were other witnesses to this named Rex Alcorn, Clifford Butts, William Burkstaller, um, who was a, or a, another uh, gentleman named L. M. Hall, who was a police officer. I don't know if that LM I have here, if that's a code or if that's a prefix for the police, Lieutenant Marshal. That's a not confirmed by my notes, but it looks like he was working in the status of a police officer at the time, motorcycle officer. And he said he got a call for several baby caskets for those aliens. And... According to witnesses also, some of the alien bodies were stored in Hangar 5 instead of Hangar 18, which was P3 at the time, or instead of Hangar 84, which at the time was P3. Another individual that came forward, um, Chet Lytle, 1953. He was a member of the Atomic Energy Commission. He heard directly from Colonel Blanchard that four alien bodies were recovered. And if we remember at the time, Colonel Blanchard was the commanding colonel for the 509th at Roswell Army Airfield. We also have Miriam Bush, who was a secretary at base hospital and was seeing the bodies. One live body was told to keep quiet about the incident in 1980 time. Miriam committed suicide, and even though they said she committed suicide, she had scratches and bruises covering her arms. So that is suspicious, but seems like we don't have any further on that so it could also just be speculation because the official cause of death was suicide for her july 6th general mcmullen ordered some of the wreckage to be sent to the pentagon for inspection and then looks like we have a cover-up uh on july 8th blanchard ordered marcel to put two carloads of the debris to the 8th Air Force head Headquarters, Fort Worth, Texas. Also ordered William Haught to put story out on the wire. He was the press information officer at Roswell Army Airfield. Brigadier General Roger Ramey, who was the commanding, who was the commander at Fort Worth, said that Marcel took a call from General McMullen, who was the commander at Andrews Army Airfield, and Ramey's boss told the press to get the press who at the time was reporter James Bond Johnson on scene, off their backs. And Marcel would have to pose with a balloon. Marcel was tricked. He went to show Ramey a map of the crash. When he returned, there was a weather balloon that was substituted for the actual wreckage that they recovered from the debris field. So the original wreckage that I had stated was replaced with a weather balloon. And Marcel knew this because he was the one that recovered the original wreckage. So he knew there was a cover-up going on. Marcel wasn't happy about this. He had to take a picture. And if anybody wants to Google the picture of uh, the Roswell Daily Record and the picture of Marcel in front of the um, weather balloon, after he had to take that picture, he was excluded from the press. They didn't want him talking anymore, according to his Marcel's son, 
later on. He said his dad was not happy about that. And you could see the look on his face during that picture that he was in disbelief that they were making him take that picture because ultimately it made Marcel Sr. Look, look dumb. It made him look incompetent. And he was going to be the butt of many jokes over the course of many years because he couldn't, you know, they were basically stating that he couldn't tell the difference between a weather balloon and something more exotic, even though he was the senior intelligence officer at one of the most elite army airfield or military bases on the planet. So for lack of a better word, him getting something mixed up like that would certainly make him look like a bonehead. And I think he knew it. So he wasn't happy about taking that picture. They also had the base weather officer there on scene to verify that the object was a weather balloon and this type of target or device called a Rawin type weather target that was on uh, weather balloons at the time. The wreckage was then flown to Wright Field in Ohio. Later on, Marcel received a degree, uh, or actually before this, so just to kind of give you a little bit of a background before this press event, Marcel received a degree from the Army Air Force in radar tech. He was highly trained in radar material and tracking Rawin targets. So, and anything else associated and ML number 307. So these were parts of the Mogul balloons. He was highly trained on these. And these were dominant parts of the Mogul balloons. So the fact that Marcel was highly trained on recognizing these objects, but they were stating at the time, he couldn't tell the difference between something more exotic and these objects. I mean, that alone tells you right, that alone tells you right there. You can do the math on that for, for yourself. And the fact that afterward he implicitly stated that there was a, a switch up, there was a cover up, but yet he was ignored at the time from the majority of mainstream press and the world. He certainly would not have been mistaken about seeing a weather balloon parts. And again, uh, just to kind of clarify, zero witnesses came forward. We have over 600 witnesses and 150 on the record that have come forward with a, the crash of something exotic and bodies that are small and non-human qualities associated with that object. We have zero witnesses, zero, that came forward for a weather balloon. So that's interesting right there. So just to kind of further drive the point home, you know, you, you would figure that if there actually was a weather balloon that crashed out there in the desert in that July of 1947, that you would have had quite a number of witnesses coming forward stating that there was a weather balloon out there and uh, zero. You know, so the switch up and the follow, uh, the switch and the follow up story, local radio KGFL in Albuquerque ordered to keep quiet by FD, FBI and FCC. Brazel gave nude sanitized story to KGFL and the angry reporter said, what about the little green men? Brazel waited until they were off the air and then he stated secretly to the reporter, they weren't green just before he walked out the door with the body language of... It almost sounds like the way the reporter's stating what happened with uh, Brazel is that he was dejected. And again, Marcel was angry. He was made to look incompetent. He said his son, Marcel Jr., said the look on his face says, you've got to be kidding me. Marcel Jr. was a respected flight surgeon and pilot. He saw the debris the morning that his dad was taking it to the Army airfield base. Nowhere in the debris was paperback foil of a balloon that was shown for the press release. Then afterwards, upcoming the next week, um, on July 10th, 11th, and 12th, the Air Force orchestrated multiple demonstrations of weather balloons being launched to reinforce the press that, press that Roswell event was a crashed weather balloon. And on July 9th, the record followed up about the weather balloon story, and the public kind of took it hook, line, and sinker, and the press took it. So there was a silence after that for approximately 31 years until Marcel became a whistleblower in 1978, which was relatively shortly before his death. I believe he passed away in 1986, so, which is not uncommon that we have these whistleblowers coming forward shortly before their deaths. Not a single piece of the, the mogul balloon, which was the balloon that they were stating later on, that was a, uh, the Air Force was stating later on that was responsible for this crash. Not a single piece of it was classified. Not plastic, not rubber, nothing. Nothing was classified. 
Um, but we had a whole lot of death threats to people that were witness to whatever crash at Roswell. So why would the Army Air Force be threatening people with death over effectively pieces of plastic and rubber? That would have been all, you know, if something crashed and it was all broken up, it would have been all that was left, just the original pieces. Um, there was no intact MOGA balloons, the Air Force was stating. T2 was the Air Material Command at Wright Field, Foreign Technology Division of Wright Field. And they tested various lab materials, they tested various materials from the Roswell crash there soon therefore after of that week. And uh, Brigadier General Arthur E. Exon stated later on, within 24 hours, everybody knew on the base basis that um, this material was not from this world. It couldn't be dented with a hammer. It was unknown material from anybody that they talked to. And this was the best of the best, the brightest of the brightest. And then um, Brigadier General Exon knew about the bodies. Charles Lindbergh was actually flown out to Roswell Army Airfield to offer options to General Roger Ramey about what the wreckage was, believe it or not. That's probably a lesser known fact about Roswell. In 1979, moving forward, the Smith Memo, which was a, the Smith Memo was a leaked document from the Canadian government about the investigation of the UFO phenomenon. It was dated December 2nd, 1950. There was a secret project called Project, project Magnet. Uh, Wilbur Smith ran the classified project for four years. And there was a few things. I'm going to sum up this memo. There was a few things that were stated during this memo, one of which was the subject of UFOs is the most classified in the United States, even more so than the hydrogen bomb. Second, flying saucers exist. Third, their modus operandi is yet as of unknown. But there's a small group working under Dr. Vannevar Bush. I believe that small group that he was speaking about, and I'm, I'm interjecting here, um, because it was known that Dr. Vannevar Bush was a member of Majestic 12, which was the ad hoc committee put together by the president at the time to look into this matter and to handle this matter, because at, as of yet that time, there was no groups like this that existed. So the entire subject is considered of enormous significance by the United States authorities. And let's see, then moving forward, we have the Majestic 12, Psalm 1-101. One, one one. This was a document that had leaked out on 35 millimeter film about MJ-12. Jamie Shandera, who was a UFO researcher in 1984, and then later on in 1994, uh, Don Berliner, who's also a UFO researcher. It was a top secret research and development intelligence operation responsible directly and only to the President of the United States, military and intelligence and civilian sectors who manage all aspects of ET presence. Psalm 101 was a 25 step. It mentioned the history of NJ-12, the description and covered within these 25 step manual was the description of ET craft, bodies, technology, removal, transport, securing the area and the press blackout that was all under the scope. And a quote taken from that was, several dead entities have been recovered along with a substantial amount of wreckage and devices from down craft. And that was stated in that document. These documents were vetted by Ryan Wood and Dr. Wood, uh, by weighted categories, eyewitness content, zingers, chronology, typology, forensics, linguistics, and anachronisms, which would be time discrepancies. Psalm 101, an example of one of these weighted categories that they vetted these documents with at the time, was a raised Z. And if you actually look through these documents, you'll see anytime there's a Z written on these documents that it's raised up a little bit. And this was an artifact from something called hot lead printing, and it occurred because some lint from infrequently used letters would drop down uh, under the Z. So when the Z would come up to actually type, it would not seat properly in the plate because it was a less used um, a less used um, letter. So it would kind of get stuck. And then when it actually was used, it would be raised up a little bit above the standard letters. 
a government press employee describe the process, confirm the authenticity of the printing. So using – this is one of many categories – you know, these documents were not faked. These were not printed in 1984. These documents were officially printed when they stated that they were printed, I believe, which was in the early 1950s. So these uh, Psalm 101 was believed to be an authentic document, you know. And in the early 1950s, this topic was not being spoken about at all. So it just gives you an idea that there's some certainly some substance to these whistleblowers you know especially at the time this was unheard of in research at all it was even taboo in the early 1970s to talk about this 1993 there was a congressional inquiry into roswell march of 93 congressional congressman stephen schiff former lieutenant colonel colonel in the new mexican air national guard tried to go to the dod the pentagon um the general accounting office they stonewalled him um according to my interview with stephen bassett they basically just made him chase his own tail and I've gotten this before and I've gotten annoyed and sometimes when dealing with larger companies and you need to get an answer and uh, this is something they don't want to give you. So they'll tell you to call this number, you call that number and that number will tell you to call this number, you call this number and this number will put you off to this office. You call this office and they'll say, no, 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 we're not responsible for this. You, you have to call the first number back. That's their responsibility. And eventually after calling two or three or four or five or six or seven, you kind of get the point. You eventually just throw your hands up and say, I'm done. It's not that important. Let's just keep it moving. So uh, technically, that looks like Schiff followed up with the General Accounting's office, and the General Accounting's investigator eventually told him that they had no authority to be inquiring into Roswell. So he had nowhere else to go. That was the office that should have been responsible for this. So if, he had, if they had no authority, who did have authority? So apparently, he found out quickly that nobody had any authority. Unfortunately, Stephen Schiff died of a rare squamous cell skin cancer in 1998. And people do die of skin cancer, uh, and I don't want to get too conspiracy theory, but there was a lot of death threats made to Roswell witnesses, and um, I guess for people that were worried about all those death threats, <laughs> it wasn't good to have one of the only witnesses who came forward dead within the next five years of him trying to come forward and inquire into this. Well, it was one of the only people at the time, officially, was trying to come forward. And uh, here we are 30 years later in 2023, and we're just scratching the surface again, like back to square one with David Grush coming forward. And David Grush is basically saying, hey, I have the credentials. These crashes are real. Hello. Maybe it's time for people to start paying attention. Because 30 years ago, Stephen Schiff looked into Roswell, i.e., which is a crash retrieval. He knew that this was a reality. They told him to go scratch in so many words. So, and this was almost damn near 50 years after the event. So you could just see how difficult it is to get at. Oh, and when they looked into it, they said the files were not, they were not available. So conveniently, they were not available. Then uh, in 1994, the Air Force fired back. They did a 23-page report. Uh, they looked into the Roswell incident. They basically said, nothing to see here, folks. Then they did a 1995 report, the Roswell report, fact versus fiction in the New Mexican desert. Again, nothing to see here, folks. Go home. Enough. 1997, they wrote a book. And I actually have a copy of this book called Roswell Report, Case Closed. And again, in that book, like I had already stated, the answer to many of these Things that people were witnessing up at Roswell was basically misidentification of crash test dummies, people making up stories, uh, people confused. You know, it's real easy to discredit witnesses, especially when a large chunk of large chunk of time has gone by. I mean, really, what do you what are you dealing with? You're dealing with people's words, and ultimately, you could just say, "Hey, no, you're confused. You don't have any proof. Do you have any proof? No." Well, then you're just confused. And ultimately, who was the one that was would have been responsible for keeping these records? The Air Force. When the Air Force is telling that you're confused and to go home and nobody else could look into it, you, you kind of have a situation there where, you know, you have the one office that's responsible for showing some accountability, not doing their jobs correctly, or themselves being kept out of the loop. So the level of security and confusion behind this matter was just tremendous. 
And even those people who had access to government were basically told to scratch. So here's some follow-up stuff. MJ-12 documents, they need to know who wrote the document. Stephen Schiff, again, was stonewalled. The high altitude drops didn't start till 53 with those crash test dummies. There was, there was a lot of clear lying and confusion being thrown out there to anybody who was trying to investigate this. The 1997 book basically blamed Project Mogul, which was a air balloon that was being launched into the upper atmosphere to listen for Soviet nuclear test explosions. Uh, there were some fatal flaws. Again, like I said, they failed to interview any firsthand witnesses. Failure to mention to the public knew about the test drops, which was officially declassified in 1972. So people were very much in the loop about what was going on with Mogul, and or they very well could have had access to this information in 1972. You would think that this book written 25 years later to let people know how confused they were. There was just too many flaws about this report and these books written by the Air Force. And, you know, Marcel came out in 1978 and he's talked about the Roswell incident and he would have damn well known that if this was Project Mogul, I mean, he was the one that was out there in the area. He would have been involved in that circle of people who knew being the senior intelligence officer and being trained as an expert on these type of devices. Um, not one single witness came forward to these balloons, as I already had stated. Strong evidence, Brazil was coerced to change his story. And now, I don't know in 2023 how many witnesses are still alive. I think last I heard, maybe there was one witness still alive who was in a nursing home with dementia. So we're at the point where we're just going to have to go through the, the history of records and the, the accounts people have given about this because so much time has gone by where almost all of the witnesses of this event have passed away, or at least military witnesses. The book The Day After Roswell, which I had previously mentioned, written by Bill Burns and Lieutenant retired Lieutenant Corso. Corso stated he had a complete intelligence school, worked under the White House National Security Council, then eventually headed the Foreign Technology Division in the 1960s. He reported to General Arthur Tradeo, who was director of the 7th Infantry Division, and um, the general of the famous Battle of Porkchop Hill. He was a chief of Army Intel at the Pentagon, awarded three distinguished service medals, Bronze Star, approached different companies with the Roswell Tech. He was given a file cabinet with some of this Roswell technology in there, some of the pieces they uh, gleaned off this ship. He would give a cover story to these companies, these private industry companies. They would develop the tech. They would keep the, they would get credit for developing the tech and they would give first picks to the army and um, then private industry would be seated afterwards with some of the runoff of the army technology. And uh, Corso claims that integrated circuit chips, which are responsible for this explosion of computer technology over the past 70 years, you know, right up until today with what, what are we using right now? You know, like life is our social connection right now is going on through smartphones and social media and all this revolution right now is, you know, according to uh, this information, it's um, a large part of responsible for those ideas about this modern computer age was uh, seeded by the um, technology found at Roswell which sparked the modern computer age. Night vision goggles for military defense, laser technology, Kevlar, which turned into bulletproof vests. I told, as I already stated, I'm active law enforcement right now, so I would be benefiting from that, certainly, because I do wear a soft vest, among other uh, things that I wear for protection while I'm uh, on patrol. 1999, American Computer Company, as an addendum to Corso's book, uh, Jack Schulman came forward. He was approached by a, he worked for a company called American Computer Company. He was approached by a friend from the Pentagon. He had papers from Western Electric Labs, claims Bell Labs had invented the first transistor. And, you know, before they invented the first transistor in late 1947, they used tech for Roswell. That was uh, he had the papers because he didn't believe the story. He had them radiocarbon dated. For anybody that doesn't know what radiocarbon dating is, it's a, I think it's there's a ratio, but as the half life of carbon breaks down, it's going to give a ratio of its carbon 
I think it's nitrogen. It's definitely carbon-14. And when it breaks down, it's going to decay to nitrogen. So using the ratio of carbon, carbon to nitrogen, you know, anytime they find anything that was once alive, they can actually take a sample of it and find out the ratio of carbon to nitrogen. And using that ratio, they can give a pretty good uh, depiction of how old something is that was once alive. And because paper is made by trees and trees were once alive, they have carbon in them and they're able to find out when you have a piece of paper, let's say from 150 years ago, if you do radiocarbon testing on that paper, you should be able to get some scientific accuracy of how old that paper was. And apparently these papers that came forward from the American Computer Company were found to be papers from the late 1940s. So these were active papers and they stated that the alien ship had electron switch uh, high speed and it acted as an amplifier. It used thousands times of less electricity, still more than they had than computers in the late 1990s. It was ridiculously accurate. So it used very little uh, electricity and it was much more accurate and much more pr productive, these chips. In 1971, Dr. Morton, the head of the transistor program, was murdered and was burned alive in his car. He was murdered. Um, the guys that I remember reading about this, the guys that got caught, I think were only given like 18 years in prison. So they were worried about him, Dr. Morton, leaking the story. Uh, but I don't know much more about this. You know, like I said, it's easy to kind of say, well, you know, just because somebody got killed or somebody got hit by a car or somebody got murdered and, you know, they used to work in some program. I, I mean, you know. It's like, it's easy to try to start drawing links and saying like, well, because they did this, they they were killed or because they did that. But I, I don't really have much further on, on, on this 1971 uh, killing of this doctor. So again, like Stephen Schiff, who died five years after he started looking into the Roswell cover up and he died of skin cancer. It's, could it be coincidental? Certainly. It's also concerning because there was a lot of death threats given out for witnesses at Roswell. Moving forward, Jack Shulman. I actually exchanged emails with one of Jack Shulman's co-workers when I looked into this matter, and they archived the papers that were showing all of this Roswell tech. Um, and I actually viewed these papers and what they were finding on these papers, the archives of where they used to keep these. He posted them on his website to American Computer Company. He was that confident that what he was looking at was proof of alien technology. And um, they got him to take those pictures down real quick. And the way that they did it was they actually intimidated him. They would go to chat rooms and they would go to message threads and, and, and anywhere that they could find this guy doing anything uh, relating to Roswell, they would post pictures of him and they would superimpose like a bullet hole on his forehead with blood dripping out of it. And, uh, you know, he just got I'm sure this guy was just trying to live his life at some point and he just got intimidated to the point where he didn't feel like getting murdered over um, talking about this because it was yielding him absolutely nothing he thought maybe he was doing something positive for humanity or you know um, for the public but apparently his work was not appreciated so he eventually became quiet about what these papers were that leaked out he, where he was storing the papers eventually, somebody broke into the office that he was working at and it looked like they maybe put a charge on the window because the glass was blown inwards and they ransacked the office and they, uh, they eventually got these papers back. 2001, General Ramey had a memo in his hand when he was taking that picture with Marcel and uh, Dr. David Rudiak, using computer enhancement, was able to glean a portion of the memo. And some of it stated that there were victims in a crash of a disk, and the weather balloon story would be fake. The revelations counter the argument of Project Mogul because there are no pilots of a weather balloon, therefore there would be no victims. Ramey could not know that years later, you know, because of low resolution analog photo that uh, the top secret document he was holding in his hand would be able to be read on that camera, which backs up Schulman's claims and Corso's claims. Oh, that's the irony that it backs up Corso and Schulman's claims because computer enhancement, it was funny that computer enhancement discovered what those documents were saying and it was the age of computers that were brought forward by this technology. So 
there's some irony there in a sense. 2005, I think it was Walter Haunt. He had an affidavit. He was the press secretary. I think I had his first name correct, but last name is definitely Haut. H-A-U-T. He was the press. I mentioned him previously. He, he was the press um, secretary for Roswell. He got the story out on the wire, the original story. He served as a bombardier during World War II, received many medals, and also serviced the scientific instruments at Bikini Atoll in 1952. That's where they tested the hydrogen bomb, which was exponentially more powerful than the atomic bomb, for those of you that do not know. And fortunately, um, knock on wood, there has been no official use of the hydrogen bomb in a world conflict, which would certainly not be a good thing, considering the, the destructive power of a hydrogen bomb. Um, he was a base information officer. He released a story in July 8, 1947, uh, 2002 affidavit, basically, don't open this until I'm dead. It's a deathbed affidavit. So he was so uh, devout of an officer and or so scared to speak that he did not want his truth being told until he was dead. December 2005, December 15th, he passed away and his letter was open. They confirmed the case. He stated that Blanchard took him to building 84, which was P3 at the time, permitted to observe the object, 12 to 15 feet in length, about six feet high, egg shape, surface was metallic, no windows, no portholes, wing tail section, landing gear were visible, bodies were under canvas tarpaulin. He did notice normal size, uh, larger than normal heads, and the size of the ch bodies were about approximately the size of a 10 year old, which would be approximate with, you know, the, the vague description of what we've seen before. And the craft and his crew was from outer space, is what he thought he was looking at. And he informed about a makeshift moor was set up and that the record, wreckage was not radioactive. Uh, he was quoted, I'm convinced what I saw was some kind of craft and his crew from outer space. Dr. Baker, who is a world expert voice analysis, said based, based on Hot's voice, that was later analyzed that he was telling the truth when he went on the record and recorded himself speaking about this. Uh, Stanton Friedman speaks out. I told you for my 2016 paper that I did for my criminal justice undergraduate, um, I was, I think one of my English classes, I did a in-depth look into Roswell, and I was able to interview Friedman via email at the time, and uh, so I kind of summed up the basis of that interview. Um, Friedman was a Roswell UFO expert. He co-authored roughly a dozen books, including on flying saucers, MJ-12 UFOs. He had a master's degree in physics. Physics. He worked 14 years with advanced nuclear systems. I think he was in Canada when he was doing this work. He had Q clearance, which is top secret clearance. He stated that the 509th was the most elite bombing group. They were uh, responsible for Operation Crossroads. And... I did not actually, when Friedman said that, I did not look that up. So Operation Crossroads was a test at Bikini Atoll. That's where they were testing starting in 1946 when they first made the bomb. They were testing the bomb. So that's just to clarify what Operation Crossroads was. There were key players in this, top secret. Uh, Blanchard was a four-star general, General McMullen who Marcel worked, uh, Marcel worked under, stated, get the press off our backs, never to talk about it again. He did a Recollections of Roswell DVD, and he had 20 first-hand witnesses himself, MJ-12. Oh, he stated in regards to were the MJ-12 documents that I previously had mentioned fake or not, because he wrote a whole book on the MJ-12 documents. And I could actually do a whole podcast on the MJ-12 documents alone, because there's just a lot going on there. Friedman states that uh, most of the so-called MJ documents are phony. He's saying that most of them are phony. And he also stated though, most atoms of uranium are not fissionable and most people aren't seven feet tall. So the reason why he made that statement was basically saying that most of the documents are phony, which doesn't mean all of them are phony. Most atoms of uranium are not fissionable which doesn't mean all of them are not fissionable because we clearly know some of them are because they're used for atomic bombs. And most people aren't seven feet tall, and that's that's very true. Uh, but there are people who are over seven feet tall. So he's basically stating that in my interview that even though real MJ-12 documents are rare, they're real. And MJ-12 was a real group, and um, there was a lot of 
looks like a lot of attempts to muddy the water thrown out there to make them all look fake by putting many fake documents about them out there. So I also got a chance to interview, and this will be my last uh, recap of uh, what I did with my 2016 paper. I got a chance to interview Kathleen Martin. She's uh, 1961, her aunt and uncle, uh, her aunt, which was Betty Hill, married to Barney Hill, were abducted by aliens, and it was uh, major news. She's angry about the Air Force lying. They were angry about the Air Force lying about their story. Half a dozen books have been written on there, including one that she co-authored with Stanton Friedman. She has a BA, uh, bachelor's degree, uh, became a teacher. She had a supervisory position. She has two collections of her work in University of New Hampshire Library, the Pro ET Hypothesis, per Kathleen Martin, was Project Sign, which was anti ET, then Grudge. The 1951 Project Grudge was put out there to re educate the public bluntly that there was nothing going on. And then this turned into Project Blue Book, which many people know that out of 25, 1.5% of all UFO sightings, 3% or more were unknowns, and then they basically stated they could probably get the number down to 0%. And many people know this has been talked about for anybody that's looked into this matter, that Project Blue Book was a basically re-education program for the, even the American public, even though it was fronted to be a investigation into the UFO phenomenon. Ultimately, the purpose of Project Blue Book was to explain it away to the public as a non-issue um, that could all be prosaically explained by natural phenomenon or misidentification of natural phenomenon of some type. And she stated it was physically impossible for the mogul balloon to cause this type of damage uh, Marcel was very familiar with weather balloons, and she was just basically stating that to sum up the end of her interview that UFO disclosure, unexplainable phenomenon, doesn't seem to pose a threat to national security, she was stating. As we're seeing now with the panels of the last few years that there is a concern with the uh, ATIP program that there was trying to identify threats to the United States. I have some information on what's going on today as we have the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. So that's the final stage right now, A-R-R-O or Arrow. And they're looking into this UAP matter. And the predecessor to that was the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, UAPTF, from 2017 to 2020. And then, you know, they had the first hearing in 2022, since the early 1950s, about the UFO matter or the UAP matter. Now they've rebranded it. So obviously, we're trying to get some public disclosures on this matter. Yeah, a lot of the talk still with this investigation of these new task force are, you know, stating that they're stating that they're going to go where the data takes them, but they're also kind of rehashing this whole, oh, we can identify most of this. Most of this is identifiable. We have not seen anything that would believe us to be these objects of, of, of alien origin. Defense Secretary Ronald Moultrie stated, there's always the possibility, he's stating, um, according to Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines. That something could be extraterrestrial. And also, Administrator of NASA, Bill Nelson, stated that there is the possibility, to sum up his quote, that some technology that is might not be ours. All right, so I'm going to kind of just go over some afterthought stuff. That's pretty much the afterthought stuff is quite a bit. I'm going to try to go over this as quickly as I can. And this is all the, like the secondary tertiary notes I took um, after reading this book on um, Roswell. And this is mostly just you know, deathbed confessions, death threats, whistleblowers. That'll be the last that'll be the last stage that I have for this Roswell book by Schmidt and Carey that I kind of reviewed before I did this podcast. Just to kind of keep me in the loop, maybe, you know, my 
ears would catch, you know, I listened to the audio book version of it and took notes on it. My ears would catch something that I haven't heard before. And it was quite a bit of that. It was almost too much to put here in this podcast. You know, it's almost kind of reminiscent of uh, just to give a quick example of if anybody read any of the Lord of the Rings books or read the book The Hobbit and then watched the movies, there was a lot of people that were upset that the books weren't true to form to the movies um, or the vice versa. The movies weren't true to form to the books. But, you know, when you have so much information, you know, just like that was one of my criticisms of that comment for those, for those people. And that's why I'm talking about what I'm talking about right now, because it's, it's related in the sense of those books. You just had so much information in those books. If you turned that into a movie, it would have been like 8, 12, 13, 15 hour movie. And you can't have a 15 hour movie, you know, and I can't have a 20 hour podcast. You know, no, no, there's not a person out there on this planet that's going to sit there and listen to my podcast for 20 hours in one episode. You know, it's to the point where people have lives and they'd like to get information, but they don't want to be so bogged down with information that they're, you know, it's almost kind of like with, with the red tape, they call it, you know, in the sense of, like what, like, like what do they do on Capitol Hill? Do they call it a filibuster when somebody just picks up a phone book and they just start reading for uh, two hours because, or three hours because they just want to burn time up and you know just drag something on and on? Um, I, f- I forget if, if that's the correct term. Somebody could correct me, but you know, like you, you could, you can get your point across, and then you can get past your point across, and then you can get your point across to the point where it becomes. No, to the point where no one's going to listen to you just because you have so much information. So I had to pick and choose what I was going to use here for this podcast because there was that amount of information that's come forward and, and I just can't include it all, you know, it's just too much. So I kind of try to cherry pick the, the best I could here. So I'm just going to try to sum that information up right now. Um, Battelle, um, which was a corporation, a uh, man named Anthony Brigalia came forward uh, and stated that the Air Force was attempting to reproduce memory metal found at Roswell, stated that two years um, they developed something called nitinol, and those were the fruits of their labor. So they developed a synthetic metal based on this memory metal from Roswell called nitinol, and I guess it's being used in the aerospace industry. Um, here are some death threats. Frankie Dwyer, she was a 12-year-old schoolgirl at the time of the Roswell incident. Uh, in 2005, she related that she was told her family would be killed by a military police officer who was probably Lieutenant Arthur Feldman um, because she had handled a piece of the Roswell ship shown by Highway Patrol Officer Scroggs. Um, she pulled Feldman out of a lineup of officers. Uh, this is now 60 years later almost. In 2005, she was still able to identify him, so that's pretty sharp. Um, Arthur Farnsworth told daughter he saw the crash when he was a rancher, and he told his family would be killed if he talked. Richard Loveridge was a crash investigator, saw three entities and two dead, one alive. Child size and grayish. Don't ask me again. They will hurt you. Uh, whistleblowers, moving forward. Let's see if we have any more. And we have more deathbed confessions. Well, let's see. Whistleblowers. We have one of the people that was, I know one of the people that was responsible for a lot of these death threats was Sheriff Wilcox, who they were stating that he himself had been threatened by the army, that he would be killed. And he had to go and put that fear of God into all of the witnesses that he knew about from the area. So he was basically being like a muscle for the Army Air Force at the time, giving people death threats. Um, Let's see if I could go when I'm going through my whistleblowers here, if any of them come up as uh, being that man or who spoke about that, if any of these whistleblowers spoke about that. So I have whistleblowers here. Whistleblowers were Colonel Dode Ress, 2007, admitted to his daughter before he died. UFOs are real and that he saw the bodies. He was Captain Cabot's boss in 1947. Charles Schmidt, local resident, saw pieces with funny writing, definitely not a weather balloon. Sidney Jack Wright, there were bodies with big heads and eyes. Hunter G. Penn stated Foster um, to Foster daughter. From the ranch that an alien spaceship had crashed, his job uh, was to intimidate by either threats or killing with weapons. Ranchers and any townspeople saw what happened. Herschel Grice, 
Marcel saw alien bodies, white rubbery figures. Marcel said in 86 before he passed away that there were things he could not talk about because of his security clearance stayed true to his words. Marcel just didn't see the crash in the wreckage. Apparently, uh, to other people, Marcel kept his mouth shut with certain aspects about what he saw as he did see the alien bodies they're stating here. Uh, Joe Montoya later became a U.S. senator, was in Hangar um, 84. I said 18 here, but... I believe it was Hangar 84, because that's, that's my research. P3 turned to Hangar 84. Um, but for some reason, I have here in my notes, Hangar 18. He was in Hangar, like I said, says here 18, but I believe that's, that's a typo. So my understanding is P3 turned into Hangar 84. Saw so small skinny bodies, 3.5 uh, feet tall with small slits for mouths, big almond-shaped eyes with large head, pale white, no hair, silver tight-fitting bodysuits, four fingers, three dead, one alive, could hear a live alien moaning and lifted its legs up. You know, moved its arm, was later threatened by Sheriff Wilcox, told his family would be killed, his brother was threatened. Richard Talbert, paperboy for Roswell Daily Record, saw an army convoy with 12, object 12 feet long, 4 feet wide, 7 feet tall, damaged under tarpaulin. Sergeant William CNS, it was a spaceship. After all those years, I don't know how that ship flew. There was no engine, I'd like to know, stated in 2008 before his death. Elazar, Benavez, private first class, delivered three gurneys, one which was the corpse of a non-human being, was still alive. He heard the living creature. Uh, alien was taken to Alamogordo in Texas. Or was that Wright Patterson? Oh, Alamogordo, Texas, then Texas, or Ohio, which would have been Wright Patterson, Ohio, where the um, Foreign Technology Division was uh, of, the, of the Air Command, where they observed the material and test the material. Very concerned about what's going on. The record, he was very concerned about going on the record because he may lose his pension. Uh, Joseph Toth, former B-29 pilot, thought three stretchers on C-54 with three short, grayish, bluish bodies with large heads. UFO researcher Leonard Stringfield met with doctor who observed the body of an alien, three to five, 3.5 to 4 feet tall, 40 pounds, no teeth, no earlobes, slight fuzz on head, web between fingers, lizard-like skin, no reproductive system, no food water system, no GI system, no red blood cells. Almost an insect-like quality, he was stating. One of the researchers to... Re, uh, research crash retrievals in the early 1970s since it was a taboo subject. So Stringfield is one of the first researchers in the early 1970s to research crash retrievals. Dan Dwyer saw the wreckage, wrecked ship with walking alien, called it child of the earth. I believe that was a term they were used for like an insect out there, like some sort of a cricket. In yeah, in regards to crickets with the head. Dr. Foster flown to D.C. to observe sp spinal structure, bone vertebrae, spinal nerves. One creature died. She observed absence of internal organs. She was threatened to be killed if she talked, and her medical license would be taken away. Lieutenant Colonel... Miriam Magruder, live alien he saw, which he claims was killed sometime later due to experiments being performed on it accidentally, told daughter of description of alien, small childlike creature, no question that it came from another planet. Uh, it, was a, it was alive, but we killed it, he stated. Then all four of the aliens were sent to Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah, uh, per Colonel George Weinbrenner. Corporal Harrison, head of the contingent of Native Americans, ordered to shoot anything that moved that was uh that wasn't a rabbit uh around a makeshift tent that was put up at roswell army air uh field base on july 8th uh, extensive detail about b29 straight flush oh uh, this was a nickname for a b29 silver plate straight flush plane that was flown to fort worth texas carrying cargo packed in wooden crate loaded from bomb pit at Roswell Army Airfield where soldiers were ordered to use lethal force if they faced any unauthorized personnel. Lieutenant Martucci, who recognized a Martician friend of his in Roswell Army Airfield, stated, we just made history. Ralph A. Molster, who was a Purple Heart recipient. Timken, which was a military contractor, was told to try to alter metal in their metallurgic blast furnace, and they could not. He was told by his daughters and wife. Charles Wood had a piece of Roswell UFO that was left in his truck from a freight yard, gave it to his son James, used in his magic art act. So he was using it. His son James was using it for a little magic art act he would do in his clubhouse, and it would be the grand finale. He would crumple the metal up. I think he would try to burn it. You know, it was part of his magic tricks. And one night, somebody broke into his clubhouse and took the memory metal from him. Deathbed Confessions. Major Eastley 
all the creatures, he stated, when presented with a book about Roswell. Corporal Lida, deathbed confession, it was an MP who saw bodies. Sergeant Homer G. Rollett Jr. saw the craft and three small bodies, part of cleanup detail, three crash sites. Two weeks before he died, he stated this. Sergeant Brown in 1986 saw bodies with small, not in 1986, this is when he uh, went on the record before he died, saw small bodies with big heads in back of an ambulance. Inez Wilcox, which I believe was the widow of Sergeant Wilcox, for space being's large head, one was alive, wife of George Wilcox. He saw the bodies. His family was threatened. And then he went on to threaten many people who live in the area because he was the sheriff at the time in Roswell. Ken Compton, after a near-death experience, stated, I saw the aliens uh, on Wilford Hall while working as counterintelligence officer. So that right there pretty much sums up the what, what I have as far as as the um, Roswell incident, I know we, I went over a whole lot and you're going to get a lot of other people talking about this. You're going to get a lot of people who are going to claim that they're experts. I do not claim to be an expert. I just claim to be somebody who has done my homework. I've read multiple books on the topic and I've gone through countless web forums and books and counter books about books trying to discredit books so I, I, I mean like i said it's the average person it's my understanding from talking with people about this they might have an interest in this matter but the average person is not going to spend i mean just start doing the math right now if you figure up it takes me a long time to read so or if you listen to an audio book now but um what are you going to spend if you take notes and read a book 10 to 15 hours or 20 hours on a book how many books do you want to read? You know, five, ten books. There's lots of books written on this matter. And then countless and countless and countless web forums and uh, papers that have come out about this. So it just seems like the average person's not going to, if they have like even an interest in this, it's more just like, oh, yeah, there's that. Like when I told my, uh, after I did my paper in 2016, when I told my teacher about this matter, and she just said, oh, yeah, the, the myth of Roswell, right? You know, there's a myth, right? And, you, and, and, you're, a little, and, you're, and you're up on this, this myth that's been going on. I didn't even get into it with her. She was, a, I think, a history. She had a Ph.D. in history there at the college I was at, at the time when she, she learned about I was working on this paper because she had a PhD in history and you know when I explained to her I was working on this paper you know I didn't even get into it with her but I remember her sp specifically telling me oh you know because I told her I had gone out to the southwest and went to the museum and she goes oh the uh, the myth of Roswell right you know so in her mind probably from now until the day she dies Roswell is going to be a myth and I think that's how well of a job the Air Force did at covering this up that, you know, you can have people who are respected professors at colleges right now, and they're never going to be able to open their mind to the fact that this was an actual historical event. You know, 600 witnesses, 6,000 witnesses, you know, uh, there may be no tipping point for certain people that have been effectively conditioned throughout their lives that there's nothing to be seen here. So it just goes to show how an effective disinformation campaign can be can work and you know how millions and millions of people even to this day walk around in this country and they think that this is just hocus pocus and myths and a child's story you know and they'll not look into it any further than that they immediately shut their minds down and they immediately give this no more time or no more effort and even though it's a very very important part of American history um, it's still not given that respect, especially at, uh, in any sort of official learning capacity that we have available here in the United States, which is sad. And that's another reason why I've done this podcast, you know, and it's the reason why I'm doing this podcast, because, you know, like I said, I'm not going to just stop this matter at UFO, UAP research, you know, anything that I come across and that can go outside of the UFO, UAP, alien matter, you know, even like afterlife experiences or, you know, any sort of other sort of potential research going on. I know a lot of people do uh, 
research on Bigfoot. I mean, I just, I just haven't looked into other matters enough right now to really be commenting on it. But I'm not against looking into other matters if I feel like there's any substantial amount of evidence. The reason why I'm focused right now on the UAP UFO matter is because this is one of the topics that I've researched, that I've looked into, and I've looked into a couple different things, you know, including. Uh, near-death experiences and, you know, what evidence we have for, you know, that the human spirit uh, survives the death of the human body. Like, that's another one where there, there, there may be, there certainly may be some places to go with that in future episodes. But as of right now, I'm very much attracted to this topic because of the nuts and bolts aspect of it. It's that we have people, we have people that have touched things that appear not to be material uh, manufactured on this planet. We have people that have seen bodies on multiple occasions, very high level people, credible people that have seen either living or dead beings that appear to have not been born or evolved on this planet. So, I mean, there's a ton of evidence going on behind these matters and that's why I focused on my first episode of Not Media, the Varchina Brazil UFO crash because that's another one. I mean you have people willing to go on the record that have been witness to, to seeing live aliens uh, or live creatures of unknown origin walking around this planet, you know, and yet, like I said, you can't find a shred of this history anywhere taught in high schools, colleges, even though it's just as real as other aspects of history. You know, you could go to school and become an archaeologist and try to dig up dinosaur bones because that's accepted reality of what's been going on on this planet, you know, and the history of this planet. But, you know, when it comes to being a researcher on creatures of unknown origin of this planet, this is all still not only taboo, it's all still top secret. It's all classified somewhere within the defense uh, aspect of this country to where, you know, maybe advances that we could find from these bodies and creatures could be factored into how we live our lives into maybe aspects of their DNA could show us aspects about how potentially in the future modifications of our DNA might allow us to live another 50 or 100 years, you know? I don't think that some, I'm not saying it's going to happen that way, but there's a possibility, you know? I wouldn't be shocked if sometime within the next 100 years, some scientist cracks the DNA code for being able to uh, upgrade us, you know, to be able to be living longer and healthier. So, you know, it wouldn't shock me in the least if 100 years from now, the average person's living till 150 years old. I see this as probably more than likely a progression. So if there's information right now that's available and it's being buried under levels and levels of security that are potentially going to benefit the greater good of humanity and this world. We should be talking about it publicly. And it should be people who are keepers of those secrets or administering and uh, administrators of these projects should be held to accountability, you know, for the taxpayers that are funding these projects. So that's why I'm that's why I'm talking about this right now because that's currently not going on. The best that we have is, uh, hey, we have this task force and uh, we're looking into it. And if we see anything that's uh, evidence that there's any sort of technology that's non-terrestrial, we'll let you know, which is not much different than what was going on with Project Blue Book, you know, as of right now. And we'll see how this plays out. But there certainly are people, senators and congressmen that want to get to the bottom of this. We will see what sort of legislature has passed that will protect the people who have access to these programs like those people that David Grush is speaking about that will be able to come forward and publicly speak about how to get this information into the civilian sector where it could be studied in colleges. So 25 years from now, when you know, if you're listening to this and you haven't started a family, but if you're starting a family, when your kids go to college, that they will have the possibility to be able to be working in programs that are studying some of this material 
and trying to further the scientific discoveries behind this to better humanity. Thank you all for listening to this episode, and thank you everyone who has chosen a life of service. This is not just military, fire, police, and EMS, but also anyone who has taken their talents and passions and used them for the service and betterment of others and this world. I'm not saying goodbye. I'm saying until next time. This is your host, At Not Media, JP, signing off. Stay well, everyone. Mm-hmm.